let's start with some good International Women's Day vibes. I'm going to ask each of you, I want to know what woman has had the greatest impact on your running and career? I know that's like kind of a big question. Emma, let's start with you. Is there a woman that stands out that's had a really big impact on your running and your career? Um, well, the biggest impact a woman has had on my life is my sister. She is just like the most inspirational person to me. Just everything she does, everything she puts her heart and soul into has translated into my running and just my competitive nature. And, you know, growing up, we were always just like really competitive with each other when it came to like board games or any like activities. And so I dedicate a lot of my just like competitive nature and that drive to her. But when it comes to like a specific like runner, if that's what you're looking for, I would say Dina Castor is definitely somebody that I've always looked up to um, ever since I was in high school and competing, just watching her do her thing in the marathon, um, just seeing like how balanced she is in daily life and, and running was just something that was really like inspiring to me. And I've kind of tried to model my career after her. So Dina Castor um, taking first at the Chicago Marathon, especially was like stuck out in my mind. And so I just really, really um, admire her and just like still to this day, she's an amazing person. Yeah. I feel like everyone's got a Dina story. Like every pro runner has a Dina interaction, a Dina story, a Dina memory, Sarah, for you, is there a woman that stands out that's had an especially big impact on your running and your career? Yeah, I'm probably gonna have to say uh, my college coach at Stanford, Dina Evans. Um, she's probably, I think the only female coach I've ever had. Um, but for me, she just, um, took over the women's program at a time where it was a really like pivotal time in my running career, where I had kind of been struggling the first couple of years in college, um, and felt like, um, that I, I was kind of more trying not to become someone than having a vision of like who I wanted to become. And I think she helped really guide me into like, um, figuring out like what that was and help help me have success in college. And that kind of allowed me to um, be able to continue to running after college and, and lead me to here I am. Gosh, it's like almost been 17 years of doing this, which is pretty wild. So, so yeah, I'm going to have to go with Dina. <laughs> Are you still in touch with her? How often do you talk to her? Yeah, um, we talk a lot. I'm actually going out there to um, do a fundraiser for her running club in May. So I'm really looking forward to that because her daughter is my goddaughter. I, I nannied for her my senior year of college and got really close with her youngest daughter. And and yeah, she actually coached me after um, college for a, a period of time as well. So So yeah, definitely still in touch. That is awesome. I love that. Mm -hmm. Emily, what about for you? Who's a woman that's had a big, big impact on your running and your career? Oh, definitely Molly Huddle. <laughs> um, when I graduated college, she I had a couple of teammates I was training with, but it really has been mostly her for the past, uh, came on 2015, so seven years. And um, she just really sh like helped show me the ropes. Like I learned really well just from like observing and kind of watching what others do. And I mean, she was like setting American records, like, I don't know, going after like medals and, and like had all these, like, she was basically doing everything that I was like, I, well, I hope to do that someday too. So I just kind of watched her and like, she was great about it because we were teammates, but it was almost like a mentor mentee role, <laughs> like roles we took on. Um, and which she didn't have to do, but she still did. And anytime I had like questions, like I, like she'd be the person I'd go to. Um, and yeah, so I like learned a lot from her. Kim Smith was also there for a bit. She was another amazing runner, um, Mary Cullen, but yeah, it's been mainly like Molly. So, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I've learned a lot, a lot from her. Love that answer. And look, she wrote a book which Yay. fittingly is out today, <laughs> how she did it. And we'll see some familiar faces in the pages of that book, which is always so fun. So I love that it's only March 8th in this year. We're only two months into the year. And like I said, running is here and racing is back and we're seeing records being smashed and PRs being broken and women just absolutely rising to the occasion and just inspiring so many. And I love that each of you are doing that and inspiring us, us everyday runners who can look at what you're doing and in some way apply it to our own lives and our own running. Speaking of breaking records, Sarah, we're going to talk about some recent races, but Sarah, we can't not talk about Houston, which 
now feels, you know, you've already run another marathon since then, but you went to Houston, you broke the American record in the half marathon. How does that feel? Is there like a welcome mat now at your house that says like, welcome to the halls. We are the fastest half marathoners ever. <laughs> no, um, I'd love to get one of those if you want to send me one, but no, um, uh, it's been, yeah, that was a fun goal, um, that I just kind of felt capable of, but like you said, during the pandemic, there is kind of slim opportunities. And so it was really special to get to capitalize on it when you feel like there's something that you've, you've been ready for, for a bit. And, um, and then to do it like 15 years to the day, basically since Ryan did it in the same place, like that was just like a fun, just, uh, just kind of summed up our careers and the, the journey we've been on where like, it couldn't have been any more different, you know, like he just like knocked it out of the park, like right away. And then for me, it's just taken like 15 years of like grinding and persevering and um, just believing there is more ahead to, to get to that point. And, but yet both like supporting each other throughout it all, the whole time. And so, so yeah, it was a really special day. Well, I hope you felt the support from afar and I hope that you could somehow hear all of us that were screaming at our phones, our screens, our TVs, however we were watching, because I assure you, we were all screaming. I live for a finish line moment. When you look back on that finish line, what do you remember most? What feeling, what image, what stands out? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. It's sometimes races are not like how you imagine them, like where so um, the announcer like wasn't saying anything about the record. And so I had a moment of confusion where I was like, wait, I did remember the time, right? Right. Like I did get this record and it was like a long time after the race till he really like said anything. And so it was kind of like, I was, I was a little bit confused and I think everyone else was, but, um, but no, it was, it was special then once Ryan got there and could like in, uh, confirm to me that what I had done. And so um, so yeah, it was, it, it was fun, but also on a, on a good note on there, I stopped at the first mat. And, uh, so you got to always pay attention, like where are the timing devices? So <laughs> in the future, it's like the second mat, I guess was the actual one. So make sure you like cross the line in the right spot. Cause like, I look back on that finish line now and I'm like crossing the first mat and kind of like dawdling along <laughs> the second mat. So yeah. That is a good <laughs> lesson. Run all the way through the finish and maybe even a little farther just to be sure that is a good yeah. takeaway how did you celebrate did you and ryan and the family did you go out and do anything were you exhausted what were the celebrations um we had some friends that came to town to watch the race and so that was really special to have them there they they actually like really don't like texas and so it, it would meant extra that they were willing to come there to they were like they're both from texas and they're like oh, that they came to houston to watch me run um and so we just kind of hung out with them and celebrated and the, the kids threw a little surprise party for me with, uh, with some friends from Flagstaff um, when I got home and that was really special. Oh, I love it. And then Tokyo, quick turnaround. Was Tokyo always on your mind even going into Houston or was that a recover from Houston, see where we're at? No, when Tokyo is happening, when did you commit to that? <laughs> Yeah, I committed to Tokyo pretty early. Um, I think when you normally do, like in the, I, I don't know, like maybe a month or two after my fall marathon. Um, but yeah, there, all along it was it was really uncertain. It seemed really like 50-50 if foreign, well, one, if they were even going to have their race and if they had the race, if foreign athletes were going to be allowed. Um, at times it seemed like probably less likely than, than likely. But, um, you know, I just kind of drew on 2020 when, there weren't any for sure opportunities, but I just kind of trained in faith there would be one. And, and sure enough, London Marathon was an option and um, I was able to capitalize on that. And so I just kind of trained in faith that it would be possible and just believed it would. And, and thankfully, um, the, the uh, Tokyo Marathon Foundation was like really relentless and jumping through the, the many, many hoops they had to do to, to allow us to come. And then it required a lot of hoops for us as well. Um, so it was definitely like one where you're standing on that line and you're like, okay, like I better make this worth it. Cause this was like a monumental effort to get here. And, um, so yeah, it, uh, I was really thankful to get to, to run there. And 
congratulations, obviously. I mean, it's always inspiring <laughs> watching you. you race. You're so gutsy. You put it all out there. And I'm curious about that. For as long as I've followed the sport and followed you, you've said, yes, this is the goal I'm going for. Like, I will tell you about it. This is what I'm doing. It's no secret, which I think is awesome. Have you always been that way? Or is that a newer development? Tell us about uh, putting the big goals out there and why you're willing to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say I'm someone that like, if someone asks me in like, I'll, I'll answer honestly, but I'm not necessarily going to like put those out there on my own all the time. I think, um, yeah. So I think like when I ran the marathon project, like, you know, I, I definitely had that in mind, but I wasn't like saying this was an assault on the record or something. Like I was just like, I'm going to just see how fast I can go. And like, I know what that pace is. And, and that's kind of how I felt with Tokyo too. Like, of course, like I know what that pace is and I'm thinking about it in training and that's a goal I would love to like hit at some point, but I'm trying not to have this kind of do or die scenario where it's record or bust. Cause I think, um, that can be, you know, there's just a lot of things you can't control, especially in the marathon. And, um, you don't want to just have this kind of mindset where anything is, um, anything besides setting a record is failing because, you know, we work so hard for these moments and, um, yeah, like even this one, I had like a pretty big setback in the, the last month. And so if you just have that, like really narrow window of success, I, I feel like it's kind of setting you up to, um, be disappointed a lot. And yeah, I think we just, we all work all, all of us on the chat, even I'm like, you know, you put so much time into your races that you want to be able to enjoy enjoy the experience, like no matter what it is, if you hit that A plus goal or not. Well, congratulations on absolutely hitting the A plus goal in Houston and on another amazing and gutsy race in Tokyo. It's so fun watching you race. Emily, thank you. Fresh off a win. Congratulations. You went out and ran and won the gate river run 15 K congratulations. Did that feel like it was your first race? since competing yeah. at the Olympics in Tokyo, did that feel like ripping the bandaid off or did you feel like an animal who was just let out of her cage? A bit of both actually, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, I was definitely a little nervous because I haven't raced since Tokyo and that was like seven months ago. Um, I haven't done like any kind of time trial or anything either. So it's like, I haven't pushed myself this hard in a while, but then at the same time, I'm like, I don't know, I've just been like itching the race. So it was kind of a bit of both, I think. Um, yeah, once like it was race day though, and like I was like walking to the start line, I don't even feel like I was just nervous. I'm just like, I'm so excited to race again. It's been so long. Um, so yeah, no, it was really fun. And yeah, I just was like riding a bike, just getting back out there again. A really fast bike. Yeah, really, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. How was the mental recovery between Tokyo and now? You know, you've dealt with some injuries, some setbacks, you know, you've had some things going on, you've moved, you've got a lot going on. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to the emotional and mental process between going to the Olympics, what I imagine is like the highest yeah. high and a pinnacle in your career, and then what happens next? I definitely um, felt that like post-Olympic, like, I don't know what they call them, post-Olympic blues or whatever for like, like a week or so after, or maybe even two, because I felt like going into the Olympics, I was like trying to kind of keep my body together. I had an injury pop up um, like two to three weeks before the race. And so um, training through it just took like, it was more uh, like it drained me more mentally, I feel like than physically, because I felt like I was just making all these decisions, trying to like get to the start line and get there like as fit as I could so I could race well. Um, but also at the same time, knowing my body was telling me I had limits now and I had to respect that. So I remember after the race was over, it was like really exciting, that really high high. But then like the next like week, all I did was sleep. Like I slept so much because I just felt, um, I just felt so tired. <laughs> and, and then after I kind of just looked after myself for like a week or two, I felt so much better. Um, but my like me and my body still wasn't quite um like where it needed to be <laughs> so uh, I tried to like get back going so I could do New York City Marathon in the fall but it became pretty apparent um it wasn't gonna happen <laughs> after like I don't even know how long I tried for I feel like it was um uh, end of September early October like it just wasn't happening and I had to just hit reset and take like a big break and once I did that I actually was like mentally okay I was like I know what my body needs I know what um, what it's going to take to get back healthy again. So I'm just going to like, I don't know, 
like pay my dues, do what I need to do and then get back racing. And then I was actually okay after that. Um, I think the hardest part mentally was like trying to get to the start line when I was um, dealing with an injury. That was the most challenging because it's the Olympics. You do everything you can <laughs> to get there and represent um, the US as well as you can. So, uh, but yeah, no, then I just got excited once uh, work got started going and um, I was able to put races on the calendar. So, uh, so yeah, I've just been really excited and I'm so excited for my next races too. I just, I'm like, just thankful to get back out there again. Well, share the race calendar with us. What can you tell us? What's coming up? What's next? When will we be cheering for you in the future? Um, so I'm doing, Coop, is it Cooper River Bridge or Cooper Bridge River Run? The one in South Carolina. It's in Charleston. Okay. It's, it's some order. Whatever you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's Cooper River Bridge. Uh, like, not positive though. I'm doing that. It's a 10K in South Carolina, um, April 2nd. And then I'm going to do VA 5K. And then I'm going to do a half marathon, but I don't know where yet. <laughs> so uh, we were like looking at different options. Um, but yeah, so that's the plan. And then a fall marathon. Uh, also haven't decided that yet, but I just want to do a bunch of road races and yeah, just get my feet wet again. So you're running the BAA 5k, which of course yeah. is right before the Boston marathon. Are you going to stick around and cheer? Cause uh, it's a pretty good field. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. And I plan on sticking around and cheering. And then also, um, since new balance is there, I'm going to meet up with them after the race. Um, and yeah, I think I, I mean, like really excited to just jump around and do a bunch of distances too, um, like 5k at a half marathon and then eventually marathon. So uh, I think it's kind of fun switching it up. Well, you're all about the roads this year, which is exciting. Emma, you just had some fun on the track. Let's hear all about it. You just competed at the 10. How are you feeling? How'd it go? How'd it feel to get out there and, and rip a 10 K on a track? Tens are so hard. They're just like an all out sprint for me now. So I went after it. It was good. I went out in like 1543, which is like crazy fast for me right now. So like even for a 5k, that was like a pretty good day, but to come home and like, I think I came home in like 1620 for the second 5k. So it was like a little bit of a grind that last bit, but, um, the field was so amazing. Like for, for that field to be so good at like such like a kind of a low key meet was so cool to see. And like Elise almost getting the American record, just narrowly missing it. But she like, I mean, she looked so good doing it as well. Like she ended up laughing me. I don't know how many laps in, but she, she ended up laughing me and I was just like trying to cheer her on. Like she looked so, so smooth. So um, it was really cool to see. And then my uh, teammate, Dominique Scott, she PR by like 20 seconds and almost broke 31. And uh, Maddie Alm, she uh, ran her debut race for the 10K. So she did amazing. So it's just like really inspired me. Like I haven't raced since Chicago. So it was really nice to get a race effort in, but just to be in like that atmosphere again with everybody just kind of like having these big goals and dreams and trying to make the, you know, the USA, uh, uh, sorry, my cat is in the back. I know, I'm like, what's it gonna do? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, just like everybody trying to put that USA meet, which is going to be so cool. It's at pre classic this year. So it's before the USA championships, which is so cool. And I think that really provides like a great opportunity for people to do the 10K and 5K. So I'm really excited to see um, what um, people end up doing. But it was nice to just kind of get in like a race effort and just get my legs under me again because I'm doing New York half in a couple of weeks. So that's like the big goal of this season is New York half. So since you mentioned your teammates and, you know, all three of you have different situations with coaching, with training partners, with teams. One thing that as a fan of the sport, I'm always interested in hearing more about is the relationships when maybe you train with your friends, maybe you're all super close, whether they're on your team or they're just people that you like when you line up, you're racing, right? Like, yeah, your friends, but also you want to beat them, right? Is that just part of the the sport because that starts as young as you know you start running your cross-country teammates yeah you, you want to win how have you navigated that and you know you can probably each speak to this differently but Emma since you just mentioned your teammates and you're racing them what's that like when you're out there regardless of the race is it just understood that we respect each other we're friends we'll play board games later but right now I'm going to run you into the ground yeah it's like not like 
as cutthroat as that as like I want to run you into the ground it's like I want to push myself as much as I can and hopefully you come with me um or vice versa hopefully I can stick with you um it's been interesting like throughout my career of like high school college and now professional that I've had kind of different um dynamics with different people and everybody on team boss at least I haven't had that competitive nature with them. And I don't know if it's because like we all kind of do different events and we all have like our different strengths and weaknesses and stuff. So like when it comes to like workouts, I never feel like I need to run any of my teammates into the ground, especially like when we get into a race together, I don't feel like, oh, I need to beat them. I don't, I don't feel that. I feel like I have so much pride if they're running really well and I hope they have an at just as much pride if I'm running well. So I don't know. It's just like, I, I want, I want to do, I, we want all one way, want to win. Like, I think that we all go into a race and we all want to win, but at the end of the day, like if my teammate is the one to win, like I am overjoyed. And like, I've never really had that before. Um, especially for other like females. I think we've all like kind of wanted to be like the alpha female in certain situations, but on this team, like, I think we're all so supportive supportive of each other that we just want it for each other just as much as ourselves. I like the phrase, the alpha female. And I will say that when you say that, I'm like, Sarah Hall, like (laughs) Sarah, you to me are so that in like in the running industry. And so, you know, all three of you are in so many different ways. Sarah, I think of you when I watch you race that like you are so, or you seem, I won't say you are, you tell me, but you seem so focused and like you are out there to do what you are out there to do. I'm curious, how much do you research your competitors, right? So let's say New York City half's coming up, Boston's coming up. Are you someone who goes into these races knowing what everyone's PRs are, how everyone likes to race? Are you totally focused on yourself? What does that side of prep look like? Yeah. Um, you know, that's funny you say that. Cause today, even I was thinking, I was like, do I want to look up, uh, some of these other people in New York City half? And I decided I didn't. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I think I'm kind of in the middle. Cause like I do, I do follow the sport. And so as you do that, you know, you know, people's styles of racing or their accolades or things, but, but I, I'm not like s- someone that just kind of eats, sleep, breathes running too. So I would say I, there's still, some, some ignorance, which I think can be good sometimes is just, um, getting in there and just like, uh, um, I think you can lose the race before if you, if you kind of like, just assume you can't run with someone. I think, I think what's really helped me is just training o- over in East Africa quite a bit, like in Ethiopia. And, um, and I think that just like, sometimes when I'm in races, like, um, where I, I just kind of put myself back there where it's like, I'm just back holding on to the pack like I did there. And so that's kind of helped where, um, I think before, you know, there can be this mentality of like, Oh, this like Kenyan or Ethiopian, like must be faster than I am or something because they are quite dominant in our sport. But, um, but yeah, I think that really helped me to, um, just be like, like I can do what they can do. And, and I'm going to keep doing that just like I did in training. So I love talking about confidence. I, it's just one of those things I never get sick of talking about. And I always can learn and appreciate from other people's confidence journeys. Emily, you've talked before about being a pretty shy kid. So I'd be Mm -hmm. curious for you, where are you at confidence wise? Are you like stone cold killer? Why do I keep bringing up like killing and running into the ground? This is like not not the vibe (laughs) I was going for on international women's day, but here we are. Uh, can you speak a little bit from being the shy kid to mm-hmm. being the woman who went out and was lapping some of the best runners in the country at the trials last summer? Like <laughs> that's got to, you know, that's got to involve some level of confidence. Can you speak a little bit about what that journey has been like for you? Yeah, I definitely have um, grown a lot <laughs> since I was that really shy kid. Um, yeah, no, I definitely, I think I have this like quiet confidence about me. Um, I do feel pretty confident and, um, my kind of attitude going into races is always to be like respectful of my competition, but also at the same time, be confident in my preparation and, um, my abilities. And that's kind of like the, I don't know, just my attitude because I never want to underestimate people. I always, like, I know, especially right now, like with how, uh, deep like American distance running is, um, yeah, I think, I think that's just kind of the attitude I take, but yeah, I don't know. I think um, confidence is something you can work on. 
And it's something that can be improved because I definitely had like really low self-esteem when I was younger and when I was in high school and even college a bit. Um, I think part of that had to do with, I just moved around a bunch and because I was so shy, like it was almost like a cycle. Um, I like, it was hard for me to make friends and I move again and things like that. Uh, so I feel like what really helped me was when I was in college um, and I was able to kind of live in one place for more than a couple of years, I was able to establish a really good group of friends and my friends are like amazing. I think like the world of them and they're also very confident women. <laughs> so I think they just like rubbed off on me a bit, just being, just being around them. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think uh, I kind of forgot what your main question was, but, <laughs> but I guess um, the one piece of advice I'd give is just to be very like, um, I don't know, like be intentional with who you surround yourself with and also like what, like um, and the type of friend and type of person you are like in your group, in your um, like circle of people. And uh, I think that helped me a lot actually. Uh, but yeah, I was really shy. <laughs> so which comes first, and you can probably all speak to this, which comes first, being really confident in life and then getting the race results because you're confident or running a really good race that tells you, oh, you should be more confident. Do you find that one comes before the other or is that a constant cycle? Any thoughts? That turned it at me. <laughs> that, that can be anyone if that <laughs> resonates at all. I'm curious. I think I've always kind of been the fake it till you make it kind of confidence. <laughs> um, I just like, I think I have to believe in myself enough for those um, results to come. And once like I do have a good result that obviously builds your confidence confidence, but um, you have to have enough confidence to get out there every day in training. And um, I think especially like when you're training for something like a marathon, um, just knowing that like you have the ability to, to run as far as you need to and to run as fast as you need to. And so I, you never really know if you can do it until you do it. But like, yeah, just kind of having that like, I don't know, puff out your chest a little bit like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this done kind of thing. I love it. Sarah, you're a mom to four girls. How do you model and how do you teach confidence? Is it something you can teach? And I am 100% asking this as a fellow mother, but whose daughter is only three. So I got some time. How do you teach or model confidence for your girls? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it is kind of like knowing who you are and, and kind of like apart from, for me, like building my identity apart from running. Cause I think it's natural when you're good at something to just kind of like build an identity around what you do. But that was like a slippery slope for myself when I was really struggling in my, especially like pro running career at times. And I didn't realize how like being successful in running for so long, like I just like that I put a lot of my self-worth in that. Um, but yeah, I think for me, like, and now I look to like my faith and other things to, to like, know who I am, like as a person, like apart from running. And I think that's important because running could be taken away from any of us at any time. Um, hopefully not, but it's possible. And so I think for my kids, I, I, I try to show them like, um, it's awesome to have something that you're passionate about and that can build confidence and you can, it can be really empowering, but then also that there's a part of you that like can't be shaken by any anything that's that you're doing you know it's just like just who you are you're worthy of love and belonging and and everything just because like god created you in his image and um yeah <laughs> all right so going back to racing we've got the new york city half emma and sarah you're both running it in the spirit of talking about goals and putting that out there and not researching the competition, um, which will that change between now and the race? Is that something you might change your mind about of, of looking up some of the times or when you said today, you decided not to look it up. Was that like, I'm not looking it up period, or I'm not looking it up today. <laughs> um, I don't think it's as much like the weather before marathons where I'm in a constant battle of look at the weather or don't look at the weather. I, I think it's more just like, um, yeah, more of a final, just like, eh, I'm going to just go do what I'm going to do out there regardless. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, most of us in the U S we all know each other. We are friends. We've been on the circuit for a really long time. So, um, so yeah, you know, those people really well. <laughs> so are there any goals for that day? Anything that you feel comfortable putting out there beyond run strong, have fun, have a good day. 
Anything more specific we're looking at? What kind of race is this for each of you on your calendars? Well, for me, this is like the focus of my season. So I want to get in there and compete. And I took fourth at the last New York City half, which is in 2019, um, which obviously it's going to be a different field. It's going to be different conditions. But anytime like you take a certain place, you want to improve upon that. And so I always want to like podium and podiums top three and top three is an improvement from the last time I ran. So that is the big goal. And I think that it's possible. I mean, a lot of people are on different pages. Um, there's a lot of, this is the deepest field that New York City have has seen, at least on the American side. And so it's going to be really competitive, but everybody is on different pages of like, you know, some people are training for Boston, some people are peaking for this race, some people are, you know, training for the 10K. So it's going to be really interesting to see like where everybody ends up because it's, it's just such an interesting time for um, American female distance running in like, especially this season. And Sarah, you're racing this two weeks after Tokyo and before Boston. So what is this race for you? Um, it's mainly just to have fun. Like I just, I really love racing and I used to be someone that, that ran all the races and then COVID happened. And then I got COVID the next year and that like knocked me down for half the year. And so I kind of miss just like racing a lot and I've never actually done New York city half. I've done like all the other ones like fifth Avenue mile and Milrose games and all the like iconic New York races, except for this one. And so, um, so I'm just excited to experience it to like run through times square and, and also it'll be a great, um, just kind of getting ready for Boston and, um, just being in a scenario where you're not really thinking about time as much as my last few races and you get to just like compete and compete over hills and stuff, which is how Boston's going to be. So with you two, Emma and Sarah, um, in some ways you are teammates, obviously you share, you can, you share ASICs. You also share team USA because you're both on our world team for the marathon this summer, which is so exciting. And of course, congratulations to both of you. So, so well-deserved and hard earned hearing about each other's very different approaches to training. Emma, you have said for months now, like worlds will be my focus for the summer. That is the goal race. Sarah, you are, I'm racing every day between now and then I race all the time. We love it. Hearing about those very different approaches. And I know you have great coaches that you trust, but I wonder if even hearing about those very different approaches to the same race, is that something that can get in your head at all? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it like, I try to put the blinders on as much as I can to what everybody else is doing. And this is why, like, I don't, I try not to follow a lot of people on social media just for this reason, because you get caught up in what other people are doing. And yeah, I like realize that if I do worry about what other people are doing, then it just, it wreaks havoc on my training and my mental state. And so, um, yeah, comparison is like the thief of joy too. So like, I just, I really enjoy what I'm doing in my training and I believe fully in what I, I'm doing in my, my own world. And so I think that's the best way to go about it and, and, you know, approaching a race like this. What about for you, Sarah, any thoughts? Do you pay much attention to that? Or, I mean, we see how much you race. We know you love it. It's no secret. And you seem very like, this is how I do things. Nothing's going to change that. What are your thoughts? Yeah. You know, I think it's always good to like learn from other people and like, I'm kind of like, what do I know? Like, maybe I'm doing it all wrong. Like probably, I don't know, but this is how I enjoy doing things. And so at this point in my career, like that's how I want to do them is, and it's how I've been able to keep improving. So it seems like it's a good route for me. I don't know, but maybe it's not, maybe I keep running better, doing it a different way. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, everyone has to kind of approach the sport, how they are most enjoy it and are most confident to do it. Like Ryan did it very differently than how I do it, even in he coaches me right now, but he's, you know, like he knows what makes me tick and like how that's different. And, and so, so yeah, I think I'm all about people like training in a way that suits your personality, just as much as we have these kind of, there's the science of running. Right. And there's certain things like you need recovery, you need all these things, but then there's also like the art of it, which is like, how do you make your training like you and put your like signature, like be you to the fullest in the process of your training. Sarah, you shared when you were in Tokyo that raw fish is your superpower. Um, and even just that picture of sushi, I was like, oh my gosh, I want that. It looks so good. 
Emily, if raw fish is Sarah's superpower, what food is yours? <laughs> uh, I don't have anything that interesting. Um... <laughs> and Emma, you know, what's coming to you next. So you can, so what's like my favorite it. food? Yeah. Or what food like gives you wings? Uh, I do love when I get home from a run and Shane has dinner like ready. So whatever he makes for dinner, that gives me that's my superpower. I love when I don't have to cook after my evening runs. I love so, when I don't have to cook, period. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. But when I'm in from like a five mile run, he's like, oh, I made dinner. I'm like, yes. So that's my super super food. Whatever you make. dinner. <laughs> Emma, what's your superpower food? Oh, tacos all the way. Before 2019 Chicago, I ate tacos, I kid you not, for seven days leading up to the Chicago Marathon for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So that was like the secret sauce for that year, at least. I didn't do that quite to that extreme this year, but um, I think I might go back to that again for my next race, tacos. So are they breakfast tacos, like tacos with eggs, or are we talking like ground beef tacos for breakfast? Either way, Um, I respect it. Well, I'm like slightly allergic to eggs. So I, I don't do like the eggs in my breakfast, but like I typically eat like steak and veggies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. <laughs> so it's a lot of that. So a lot of people probably wouldn't enjoy that for breakfast, but I do. Oh, give me steak any time of day. And I'm very happy. Yes. Absolutely. I'll choose steak over <laughs> eggs. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, Well, this seems like a good part in the conversation. I do want to ask, since this conversation is being brought to us by UCAN, and you all, of course, use and rely on UCAN quite a bit, I just want to know what each of your favorite, love it, uh, what's like the number one must-have UCAN product, if you had to pick one, and I know that each of you use a lot of the different stuff, but recommend one thing for everyone who's listening, for everyone in the chat, what should they get? Emily, we'll start with you. What's the I favorite? like the protein plus energy um, cookies and cream for after workouts. Cause I used to always struggle with like having a protein shake after a workout, but it is really important uh, to like fuel right away. So I, that's like my go-to. I have it after every single workout and long run and it just sits like really well in my stomach. So it's like, the, that's the only time I've ever experienced that <laughs> with a protein drink. Usually my stomach's like in bits. <laughs> so uh, that's definitely my favorite. Emma, what about you? What's the number one? Uh, I would say the edge, which is like their new like gel packets. Um, they taste so good and I can just like pop one in like either before a run or during my run. They're super easy to transport. Um, and I think I've told a lot of people this, but they taste like smoothies. Like they're so, so good. And I normally hate gels because they're usually like thick and sticky and like don't taste really good. Like tastes like too sugary. And the, the you can edge is just like that perfect mixture of like easy to get down, but like, it doesn't get all over yourself. Like I'm really bad at drinking things when I run. And so it's just like, I try to drink it and then it's just all over my face, but like with these little packets, it's so nice. You can get it straight into your mouth. Love it. Sarah, what about you? Favorite product? Um, if I just had to choose one, I'd probably say the the cherry berry almond bars. Um, really love those bars. And I would probably really love all the like chocolate peanut varieties, but I have a peanut allergy. So um, definitely recommend those if you're not allergic to peanuts because they look really good. But um, there there was a chocolate almond one that's really good too. Um, I'm not sure if that's still available, but- um, Yeah, that's my favorite. It might not be available if I bought them all, but that's that's my go-to, the chocolate almond butter. Uh, Well, great choices. And it's just so fun. The three of you are on fire and you have been and you'll continue to be. I'd love to know each of your thoughts on women's distance running in the United States right now. As a fan of the sport, again, I see that it is the fields are deeper than ever. The times are faster than ever that women just keep rising to the occasion. Even last year when they announced that the time standards for the Olympic marathon trials that we were going from 245 all the way down into the 230s were 237. Obviously, all three of you are well within the qualifying time, but a lot of women are like, yeah, we're not scared. We're just going to train harder and we're going to do it. I'd love to know each of your thoughts on how you see the state of women's distance running right now. And I'll let whoever's ready to jump in and answer that one. I was a little surprised with the, the, like just the standards for the trials for the next, um, 
2024, just because it was such a big jump. Um, but then just seeing the response of everybody else that is like trying to buy for that, you know, 237 is just like incredible. Like they're just like, yeah, let's do it. Let's get our head down and, and work hard and, and we'll get there. And so I love that like women are just like believing in themselves more and more every day. And um, people like, you know, Sarah Hall and Kira, like breaking American records, like it's been such a long time since, you know, the marathon record has been broken as well. And so just to see that is just so inspiring and so much more motivating for me and everybody in the sport especially and so just seeing um you know the trajectory that we're on is just something that's really special and I'm really glad to be a part of it I think everyone just keeps raising the bar for each other it's um like what's that phrase like iron sharpens iron <laughs> like, yeah like yeah once you see someone else do it like I have a feeling there are going to be a lot of women running really fast um in the half marathon and marathon now like just seeing like those records broken it just kind of it's funny how that works but um but yeah it, I, I think it's a like Emma said the response of women when they change the standards has been like really cool to see and I'm like there's no doubt a ton of women are going to qualify again for the 2024 trials so yeah I think um it's, it's good it's good it challenges everyone and it brings out the best in everyone Sarah, you've yeah, been in I the think... sport a long time and now you're, you're raising that bar. Uh, like we said at the very beginning of the conversation, fastest American woman, half marathoner ever, which is really cool here in the U S. So as someone who's raising that bar, how does that feel? And, and what feelings do you have around that? Yeah, I think it's, it's neat to see even just, I mean, since I've been running professionally almost 17 years, just the attitudes towards that like um so at the elite level and then I think there's like a trickle down um to everyone but I know when I was running professionally early on it was kind of like even like with family members it was like okay you've like had your fun now like let's make a family and like do you know what the woman things like <laughs> like the, enough with that um but like now I think it's just becoming more like acceptable that like no this is like my path like this is my passion and it's just as valid as like a man pursuing their passion in this way and I think also just the trickle down of um like women just prioritizing time for themselves like when, even when they're moms and stuff like before it was like motherhood was like martyrdom you know and you were only a good mom if you were completely selfless and your whole day revolved around your kids and like you're like polishing their grapes individually you know and but like I think for me it's like like, no, like the best thing I can do for my kids is like show them what it's like to be alive and like have something that makes you come alive because that's what you hope for them, you know, and you get to model so many things to them in real time, like through what you do. And, uh, and I think more and more women are kind of realizing that, that like, yeah, you might take an hour or an hour and a half away from being with your kids on the weekend, but like that's that's so worth it for so many reasons. And, and your kids don't even miss you for that hour. It's like, they're so happy, like doing whatever they're doing. You know, it's just like the mom guilt stuff that really is like in your head, but um, yeah. So I think that's all part of it. But. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I feel that deeply. I remember early in motherhood, just feeling like it was all about suffering and like yeah, I found it hard to share things early on because people would like criticize if I wasn't suffering enough or if I was suffering too, you know, everyone's got an opinion about everything. Um, but I do remember getting comments early on um, along the lines of like, you're so lucky that X, Y, Z. And I'm like, oh, trust me. I am the first to acknowledge I'm lucky, but also like going to the grocery store so isn't hard. really like self-care. It's kind of a thing I have to do. It's not really like, yay, I'm at... Hannaford. It's not that exciting. It's just like grocery shopping has to get done. But on the topic of fun self-care, uh, for lack of a, you know, less cheesy term, I guess, what are each of your favorite ways to sort of, whether it's an indulgence or just relax, but if you've got some time to yourself, what's your favorite way to spend it? Emma, we'll start with you. Uh, definitely backpacking, like being out in nature and like t definitely taking my dog with me as well. She's such a great adventure buddy. So, and I live in Boulder now, Colorado. There's so many amazing places to adventure to. And, um, I definitely try to, every time I have a break, try to get out there and it's not much of a physical break, but it's definitely a mental break for me to, to get out, you know, and be climbing, uh, all these mountains and seeing all these new things and kind of 
just becoming one with myself again and learning um, more about myself, um, a different side of me that's not like attached to running. And um, I just like, I feel so much um, just joy when I'm out there and um, yeah, that's, that's probably the best way. And then I really like to paint too. So if I'm not able to like get outside, if it's winter, if it's cold, you know, I, I just really immerse myself in something creative and that's like definitely a great outlet for me. I love that one. Sarah, did you find a hip hop class yet? Last we talked, you were on the hunt for a great hip hop class to take with one of your daughters. Did you find one? I tried very hard and I was unsuccessful. I think there's a big market out there for people listening for mother daughter hip hop or I don't know, parent child. I won't be that um, narrow, but hip hop classes because no one would let us or both of our age groups into the one class. So we're, we're only, we can only do YouTube uh, <laughs> tutorials <laughs> right now, but she is taking hip hop. So, all right. And well, I can use anyone... a break of, from activity. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, what's your favorite way? You've got an hour to yourself, not counting like a run or stuff that needs to get done. What's your favorite way to spend it? For me, I think um, connecting with friends, like whether in person or on the phone, like I think more and more, I, I like with what we do, it can be really like self-centered and kind of um, myopic at times. And I think I've realized more and more the last few years, like life, like the biggest, most important thing in life is the relationships and like um, just wanting to really like invest more in my friendships and stuff. And so that to me, I, like really fills me up to like really connect with a friend. And Emily, what about you? Hour to yourself. How are you going to spend it? Mine's the same as Sarah's. Um, yeah, because I, I do spend a lot of time on my own, which I like, I do love reading and I love, um, yeah, like, I feel like that's like my one hobby, <laughs> but, like, puzzles. but for me, it is, it's the same. Like I love, um, like me and my like best friend, we like FaceTime once a week. And then my friends from college, we do a Zoom every single month. And so we're just picking up the phone and like calling uh, just like friends randomly, but, like that's like so important to me. Um, and especially because most of us don't live near each other, but, um, in Phoenix, I actually had a couple friends down there, like meet up with for just like coffee or wine or something. And I like, that always was like, I always felt so good after those like nights, just catching up with friends. And, um, and yeah, I think that's like, for me, probably my, I know it's not, I don't know if that falls under self-care, but it feels like it does for me. Um, so yeah, that's what I would choose. Yeah, I absolutely think, I think that's like I think connection is the most important form of self-care, at least that resonates with me quite a bit. So I want to turn it around then. And you all gave such great reasons and, you know, in turn, we can see that as advice, but now I'm going to say, let's give some advice for everyone who is listening, watching part of this conversation, give everyone a little bit of a, whether it's a talking to or a lecture or a like do this for yourself. Like sometimes, right. We need that permission. We need someone to say like, you deserve an hour to yourself, go take it. What would you say to everyone listening or watching regardless of sex, gender, everyone deserves some time to themselves. Give them a reason to take it. Emma, we'll start with you. I mean, I've learned throughout my own experience in running, at least that like the more more balance I have in my life, the better my running goes and the happier I am, the better I run and the more energy I can put towards running. And so, um, yeah, I think like the biggest thing that I've done is just like through self-care, but like whether that, yeah, again, be going backpacking or talking with friends or, you know, just something simple as like, you know, just treating myself to something special that day, like coffee or, you know, a muffin or something, I don't know, ice cream, whatever it may be, just like every single day, like have something that you enjoy and it doesn't even need to be an hour it can just be like a, a moment of your of your day that like really just turns it around and um that's that's what I've kind of focused on most is just like being in the here and now and like yeah like results are are important too but like the process is everything and just making sure that you're happy every single day because life is too short and and we just need to enjoy every single moment if we can yeah I love that Sarah what about you yeah, I think um, just remembering, like, I, I think as, as runners and athletes, we can kind of like live in the physical a lot, but that we're like spirit, soul and body. And like when one thing gets neglected, like you definitely feel that. And, and I, I know for myself, like when like spirit or soul or like those things were 
I was depriving those, like I was physically not also running well. And so it's like important to like, just see yourself as a whole being that way. And so just figuring out like how, how, what makes you like come alive or like, how can you recharge in those different areas? Um, and, and yeah, um, do it, (laughs) do it. I love it. Emily, give us some advice. Give us a a stern talking to why we should go take time for ourselves. I'll be very stern. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's important generally um, for many reasons, but um, like I've noticed when I'm not looking after myself and I've talked to my husband Shane about this too. If I'm not looking after myself and I'm not in a good place individually, then I'm not like being like the best version of myself and like my relationships and my friendships and my marriage with my siblings, things like that. Um, and I've talked to Shane about that before too, because I married like the most selfless man. <laughs> and so sometimes I'm like, you need to look after you <laughs> because, um, because yeah, it is important. Like when, when you're taking care of yourself and you're resting and you're, um, like taking time to recharge and, uh, taking time to like, like eat well and recover. Um, then I feel like you're just in a better place and you're able to bring like that best ver- version of yourself to your work, to your relationships, to um, to whatever really. And, um, yeah, I notice when I'm like neglecting things, I'm not, I might not be the best person to be around. <laughs> so, um, and it is hard. Sometimes life just throws like random stress and challenges at you and you just have to do the best you can. Um, you can't have, I don't think you can have everything perfectly balanced all the time. Like sometimes when you move, like that's just stressful. It is, it's good stress, but it's still stress. Um, but finding time to like recharge, look after yourself. I just think it's so important, um, for all those reasons. I don't know if that made sense, but <laughs> Yeah, it absolutely does. I also love, I know you were talking about it. I think it was before we started recording that you were racing on moving weekend. Like yeah. you guys were in the process of moving and you were but racing that, that weekend. So many times <laughs> I closed on a house the week of the Olympic trials and my realtor was like, I don't know if I should bother you right now. I'm <laughs> just like, uh, just send me whatever to sign. But it, like, it is just like, uh, it's just crazy. The timing of it, it happened. It's happened like three times now. <laughs> yeah, but look how it worked out. Like close on a house, win at the trials, moving weekend, win at Gate River. Like we just had USA's one week too. And I'm just like, why do so we just keep, keep buying this? houses yeah, that's, and you'll keep winning races? Maybe. <laughs> or we should just move less. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think there's a good pattern there. Yeah, um, yeah there, there is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I do want to ask, um, and people can chime in in the chat because we have a couple minutes. We're going to do a fun little sprint to the finish in a minute, but we did get a question here. Um, someone asking for each of you, what is the race city or venue you've been to that you enjoyed the most? So favorite location for a race. (laughs) I feel like, like that's like, you can't say that because every race we go to is like, I mean, it's such a cool experience every time. And it's so different every time. Um, I mean, every, like, I've only been to one world major, but every like world major that I've like been at like New York and Boston has just like the atmosphere is just so electric. And like, I can't, like, you can't like really just put it into words, like how just amazing that is for everybody to like come together for like this one running event. And like, that is so cool to me that these world majors can like bring so many people together from all facets of life, all different countries. And so anytime I'm at like a world major, a really big race, like I, that's my favorite place. Do each of you like having races with a lot of spectators? Does it make a difference? How much do you notice? Are you all about the fanfare? Does it matter? How do we feel? Yeah. I I think it matters a lot. Yeah. It can also be like like a little overwhelming, like the Olympic trials were a bit overwhelming for me anyway, but every other time I've loved just like that, that energy and that excitement. And it's really hard to kind of bring out more of yourself when it's dead silent. So, yeah. Sarah, what about for you? So now we got two questions, favorite venue, race or location. And how do we feel about loud crowds, love or meh? Um, well, I think atmosphere is huge. Like I, I definitely factor that into races I choose and I really missed it in Tokyo because they were told not to spectate or like, if you were there not to cheer, (laughs) there were like signs like no cheering. And it was like, it was really quiet out there. And I really missed like how Chicago was. And, and I, I ran Tokyo five years ago and it was, it was really an amazing atmosphere. So I know they'll go back to that next year, but um, but yeah, I, I think for, if I had to choose one, I don't know, it's 
all three majors in the U.S. I've done were like so amazing. And I think I've just, I've had so many races in New York of different distances too, that like that just stands out as somewhere that always just brings it with the crowd. Um, and, but yeah, so it is Boston and Chicago, but, um, but yeah, definitely racing at home is you're always going to have like just so much more of a boost out there. All right, Emily, favorite place and thoughts on loud cheering. Uh, New York city is my favorite. Um, I love the atmosphere there. And I just like, I, I, I don't know. I love how New York Roadrunners puts on all the races. And then I love after the race, all my friends are in New York. So I can see them. So it's just like always like really fun weekend. Um, and atmosphere, I do appreciate it. And I do, but I feel like when I'm racing, I'm so focused sometimes. Like I don't actually even notice what's going on uh, around me in the crowds. Like I feel like someone famous could be on the lead vehicle and I wouldn't even notice. <laughs> so uh, I, the only time I ever really noticed how loud loud the crowds were was at the Olympic marathon trials. And that was the first time I'm like, wow, that's really loud. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I feel like I'm kind of so like zoned out that I, I think it helps a lot, but I'm also just kind of like probably living my head a bit. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, I will tell you, so normally on the alley on the run show, and you've all been through this multiple times, we end every episode with the sprint to the finish. And these are our like fun, silly rapid fire questions today in the shower. I was like, I need to come up with an international women's day sprint to the finish. Like how can we end? That's going to be like really empowering. And instead I came up with very silly questions. So (laughs) we'll end on an empowering note, I swear, but we're going to go through a little sprint to the finish. Um, I will ask the question. We'll do Emma, Sarah, Emily each time. How does that sound? Perfect. Emma, I know you're up first every time. That's not fair, but, um, (laughs) all right. So these are all like women centric categories, kind of, um, I literally wrote this on a note card while I was like in my towel, still dripping wet. Um, yes. Okay. (laughs) Favorite actress. Oh, uh, Alicia Vikander. Do you know, do you guys know who that is? Oh, she was in the Danish girl. She got best supporting actress for that, that year. Um, I'll Google it. Again from Uncle. Uh, I'm, trying to I'm not cool. I'm not cool. <laughs> I'll look it up. Yeah, Good yeah. Answer. She's a Swedish actress. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, favorite actress. I'm gonna go with Rachel McAdams. Classic. Emily. <laughs> uh, these. <laughs> I thought I'd have time to go last. <laughs> uh, God, I don't know. Um, I thought that we just finished watching what's that show that's on HBO that's really popular right now. Euphoria. I just finished watching that. I'll pick one. Oh, Zendaya. <laughs> so good. I love Zendaya. Um, yeah. So I'll say her. <laughs> okay. What about favorite singer? Favorite female singer? Uh, yeah. uh, probably Florence. Florence and the Machine. Yeah. Ooh. Sarah, who you got? What just came to mind is Sia. I'm not sure that's like my all-time favorite, but at the moment, listening to a lot of Sia. <laughs> it's also funny that you say that because I have always thought, and I wonder if anyone's ever told you this, that you know Maddie Ziegler, the little dancer girl who's like Sia's muse? I've always thought that she looks oh, yeah. like you. Has anyone ever told oh. you that? No, thank you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I think she does. I mean, I haven't seen her recently, but I've always kind of thought that. And so that you just said Sia feels <laughs> very fitting. Emily, that favorite female sense. singer? Uh, Florence is a good one, but I, I'll say something different. I'll say Lizzo. I love Lizzo for long runs. When I'm hurting, I'm just like, <laughs> I, need, I need some Lizzo. <laughs> All right. So none of these are going to be in the running category because it didn't feel fair to pick like our favorite female runners, right? Mm-hmm. But what about who is your favorite non-runner woman professional athlete? Probably Serena Williams. Um, she has completely changed the the sport entirely, and just like she just does what she wants unapologetically. So big, big fan. Yep, love it. Sarah, uh, probably Kelly Clark. She's a half pipe snowboarder that I got to know living in Mammoth Lakes when I lived there. She's also from there, but just her whole approach to the sport, I've learned a lot from. Very cool, Emily. So I don't know a lot about her, but growing up, Mia Hamm was my idol. And so I feel like that's, she's the one who I looked to. I was like, wow, that's like a really cool, like, like powerful professional woman in sports. So I feel like she like inspired eight-year-old Emily. So I'll say her. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like we like all grew up knowing Mia Hamm, and then I yeah. I remember, and I think I'm I'm older than some of you, but um, I still remember the Brandy Chastain moment oh, where yeah. she ripped her shirt off. That was just so iconic, and it was like, look at this awesome woman. Like I love this. Um, so I think about that often, knowing nothing about soccer. I. <laughs> remember that moment everyone remembers that yeah yeah iconic what about who is your favorite tv mom so fictional character tv mom i don't oh god i don't really i don't watch much tv so i don't know who that would be like you know like i watch like game of thrones and who like the mother and that's like cersei that's not that's not good Um, I'm gonna have to pass because I can't think of anybody. Oh, That's okay. Fine. Well, sorry. Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Um, I love that show, and Aunt Viv. Um, that. Uh, I don't really, really remember her, remember her name though. Aunt Viv, right? Is that yeah? Okay, Vivian. Yeah, yeah Aunt Viv. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's yeah. my That's great my one. Name. Great answer, Sarah. Favorite TV mom? I'm gonna go with Mandy Moore in This Is Us. I feel like she's actually like like taught me things about parenting from watching that show <laughs> oh, and it's on tonight we're recording this on tuesday it's back it's been on hiatus yes, I think, and i think it's back like through may now like through the end which is kind of sad it's ending yes yeah this emily favorite tv mom mandy moore is a good one um the, the only one that came in my head when you said that was uh, uh gilmore girls I or loved I. that show growing up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know. I haven't watched it in years. But I remember I loved it. So I'll say Harry. I don't know if I would still say the same, but. <laughs> no, she was good. She was like a cool yeah. mom. Yeah, she was. All right. Mm-hmm. Assuming I, I make the assumption that everyone has seen the TV show Friends. I feel like it spans generations. We've all seen it. We've got Rachel, Phoebe, and Monica. Who is your favorite Friends woman? Oh, Phoebe by far. Yeah. Smelly cat is like my favorite song (laughs) from a a sitcom. So she, she's so much fun and just, yeah, again, does what she wants unapologetically. Sarah. I'm going to go Rachel. Emily. I was going to say Janice at first, but I won't. (laughs) Um, Totally say Janice. I I thought I'd say something like that. Um, (laughs) No, I'd, I'd probably say Rachel too. Yeah. All right. What about your favorite Disney or animated character, whether it's a Disney princess or just like a super tough animated woman who comes to mind? Uh, Probably Belle from Beating the Beast. I always admire her growing up and just like um, her want for like a like more complex life, like just kind of getting out there and adventuring. And I just that really resonates with me. Sarah. Um. I'm going to have to go with Jasmine from Aladdin. (laughs) Great answer. Emily? I'm trying to think of Disney characters. I watched Brave recently on a plane. I don't know what that character's name is, but she seemed cool. Marita? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but we have many Disney sticker books in our house. And so I. Okay, I watched that. All right, she's cool. (laughs) Okay, so this one is in the running category. Who is your favorite woman to race? When you see that this woman is signed up for a race you're running, who are you like, heck yeah, I'm pumped she's racing with me? Can be a teammate, a competitor. (laughs) Who? Sarah Hall. (laughs) Definitely. Oh, thanks. You always always know that she's going to go out there and just lay it on all out in the course (laughs) or on the, on the track. So I really admire that about you, Sarah, that you just like, you give it your all every single time. Oh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Sarah, who do you have? Um, I always said like my, my favorite friend of me was Alephine because we had like so many battles for a while. It was just like me and her, like all these US championships, like duking it out. But she's, she's just like such a fun, like funny person too that like, but she like, she makes me, she like brings out the best in me. Like she makes me hurt really bad. The first mile of like a half marathon when you're like, darn you Alephine, why can't we just like ease into this race? <laughs> <laughs> and Emily, who do you love racing? Uh, I can think of a few people, but um, I like some like people like um, like like Wayne Kaladi, who I know is gonna like help push it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> and she, I like her as a person too, which does help. Me. 
with the race. <laughs> um, so when I see like someone like that on the start line, I'm like, okay, she wants to run like hard and she wants to run fast too, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so someone like her or like maybe even someone from like another country, like an Ailish McColgan, who's like trying to run really fast and I know can like, likes to push it too. Like people like that. Like I like racing people that I know kind of just want to run pretty hard. <laughs> I love it. Well, in the spirit of connection, which I think we can all use more of every single day, I would love to end this with each of you giving everyone listening and watching a reason to text, call, or just reach out to a woman they love today. Emma, I'm going to put you on the spot to start us off yet again. Why should everyone reach out to a woman in their life today? I mean, we have all become the women we are today because of other women. And I mean, I can think of so many women that have impacted my life in so many ways and so many positive ways. And again, I just don't think we were able to like sit down and really think about that and like think about like the gratitude that we, that they deserve. And um, I think today is like such a, a good excuse just to do that. And I think it'll mean so much to that person. Like when you're on the street and like somebody gives you a compliment on your shoes or your hair or something, you know, like how good that that makes you feel and for that to like you know it's just so impactful to reach out to somebody for something that's like beyond just like you know a physical appearance like they actually changed your life in a way that has been like super just um inspiring and motivating for you and I think that's something that they would really really appreciate and I know that I would really appreciate somebody reaching out to me for that reason and if you can just inspire somebody you know just one person in your entire lifetime to do something um, that's beneficial to them. That's something really, really special. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Sarah, why should we reach out to a woman in our life today? Yeah, I think what I mentioned earlier, just like relationships are like the most important thing about life. And so, um, yeah, there's like nothing better than being able to tell someone how much you value them and why. And yeah. Emily, bring us home. And I just think we can all think of women that have like changed our lives and like our lives are better for because they're in it. And so I, I try to also, I think it's important to also like emulate that and kind of pass that on. Um, uh, so I think like, I don't think I can word it better than <laughs> I'm just worded it. So <laughs> um, I just do think it, it is important because um, to be that like friend because we are like I don't know I think I mentioned earlier how like I'm just so careful with like um the people I surround myself with are all these amazing incredible women and so I want to be that friend for people too um it's not all just about like other people it's about like the energy you give off and the type of friend you are and um yeah I don't know I just think like what you like what you get what you give like it just it's I don't know it's just really important I love those reasons. Well, I thank all three of you for being inspiring, for being gutsy and brave and for always putting it all out there. I would imagine that most of us watching and listening are not professional athletes and are never going to be, but watching the three of you show up the way that you do every single time is so inspiring. So thank you for leaving it all out there every single time. Thank you so much. You can for having us and for giving us this space to celebrate each other and international women's day, Katie and Varen, you guys are amazing. And the whole, you can team. And of course, thank you everyone for tuning in and being here with us today. I hope you all enjoy your evenings, celebrate yourself. We got so much good advice about ways to spend an hour for ourselves. So take that time, celebrate yourself. Emily, Emma, and Sarah, we are cheering you on in all of your races and in everything you do going forward. Happy International Women's Day. And thank you for joining me on the run. Thank Happy you guys for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming.